Everybody ready? Google already knows that, so. Wait for everybody to sit down and we'll get started. Sweet. All right. Uh, hello. Hi. Welcome to Well Simple. Uh, my name is John. As you heard, I work here at Well Simple, and tonight I want to tell you about how you can lead change at your company or your project or your team. But first, I want to take you on a journey. This is an old picture. <laughs> you can't tell because of the computer, right? right. No, that's me, if you didn't know. I recognize you. Yeah. You look great now, don't I? Um, I'd love to tell you that I was like one of those kids that loved programming growing up, and I was writing programs out of the back of a textbook that I got from the library. Um, there wasn't. I just love computers for video games. <laughs> Namely, this video game, best video game ever. <laughs> Put your hands up if you know what it is. Amazing, how huh? more than I expect? So I got to programming late in life. Um, I did a little bit of university. I went to business school. I uh, took a career path a little bit different. And then this guy did something, changed the world, right? Also changed my world. My career took a right turn. I thought, that thing's really cool. I want to build stuff for that, right? iPhone 2. It was called iPhone 2. It wasn't called iOS. It was called iPhone 2, and it launched in Canada, uh, a little bit later than the US. And I got to play with other apps. It was fun. Apps were $10 a game. $10 to buy an app. Can you believe it? Some were free. Some. They weren't very good. Yeah. <laughs> iOS 3 came out. I'm like, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to dive in. I'm going to learn. I had to learn Objective-C. Who knows Objective-C here? Anybody? Like one person? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, no, I'll <laughs> um, I had to learn what's a view controller, what's Xcode, right? And then a couple months later, they released this thing. It's an iPad's a bigger screen, no big deal. I can handle that. It's a little bit of math, right? I'm okay. I was four, we had multitasking, background location, updates. I was five, we had iCloud, Arc, storyboards, you know, Twitter. Core Bluetooth, GL Kit, iOS 6 came with Passport Game Center, in-app purchases, collection views, auto layout, iOS 7 had, oh, it's fooled you, had a new design. <laughs> right, UI Kit Dynamics, Text Kit, Sprite Kit, Scene Kit, JavaScript Core Engine, iOS 8 came with app extensions, Touch ID, Metal, Health Kit, Home Kit, Size Classes. Come on, right? My head's exploding at this point. This is a lot of work. This is many years, too, and it just accelerates. It gets more complicated as you go on. <sighs> But, you know, I'm starting to feel good. And I got this. I feel good. I can handle this, right? You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> really? I remember this day because I was I was watching WWC and I looked and I was like, oh, I gotta start all over. And I, I was frustrated, I was angry, I was sad, I was like, oh man, this sucks. But I got to think. Right? I was like, all right, I'm going to try hard. We're going to learn, right? So I got into Swift, and I realized like how awesome it was to learn new stuff again. Right? New paradigms in Swift that we hadn't seen in Objective-C. Functional programming right? it was one big one. Uh, optional values, right? things that we can bring back to like the stuff we were doing previously. You know, I realized it's this curiosity that's super important to us as software engineers on how we can bring value to the jobs that we do and how we have the biggest power in our organizations to really change the way that we work and the way that our companies work. Whoa. That was not intentional. <laughs> okay, so changes at Well Simple. There's a couple big ones we've made since I've been here. Uh, and a lot of it's been curiosity related, but one of the big ones is uh, in our mobile app, as you can imagine. I'm a mobile developer by heart, by nature, is where I started. This is our mobile app. Uh, hands up if you've seen it. I've seen it. Yeah, great. Um, it was originally an iOS, fully iOS app, fully native iOS and native Android. It's now probably 90% built in React Native. Big difference. We're going to talk about why and how we got there in a few slides, but I want to bring up one more example. This is our logged in product on our website, built in Angular 1. Angular 1 is old. 
now's the time to think about whether or not it still makes sense going forward. And we're going to talk about some of the questions we ask, right? What other options do we have? We have React, right? We have Angular 2, we have Vue, we have JavaScript framework number 797. Any of these are possible. But we've got to do a couple things first. So what are our first steps, right? There's two questions you have to answer when you're doing anything related to change. First one's why? Why do you want to make this change? Why? I have two boys at home, and if ever of you have been around children, this is their favorite question. Pull your pants up. Why? To pick up your toys. Why? Go to sleep. Why? This question is so important at so many levels that we have to be able to answer this before we decide that we want to make a change. Right? Why do you want to move to React from Angular? Why? Why do you want to use React Native instead of our native stuff that we already have? You have to be able to sell it to yourself. You have to be able to answer those questions. right? Because if you can't sell it to yourself, how are you going to answer people when they're looking at you like this? As we work in organizations, we have to be able to answer the question, what's the business case? Why? What is the business case? Um, I went to business school. I can tell you what is the business case. It's just a nice way of saying, show me the damn money. Right? So where's the money come from? Why am I doing this? There's two ways to make money, right? One is increase your revenue. Two is to... Decrease your costs. Pretty simple. Business school, don't no, it's easy. Okay. <laughs> so how do you answer these questions? Well, you need to do your research. You need to learn. You need to read. You need to watch. You need to experiment. You need to go out of your way to give become as much knowledge. Whoa, too far. You need to answer as many questions as you can, so you're prepared. So as you, I got a sneak peek there. Here's one. So with React Native, this is pretty easy, right? We went from shipping two different code bases. We're now able to write a single line of code that we can run on both platforms, and we can ship the same feature quicker across two different platforms. It's an easy win. Here's another. Is the change you're proposing going to allow you to bring in more users, more clients, more money? This one's interesting for us. Um, uh, if you don't know much about React Native, it's basically JavaScript, and everybody here knows JavaScript, good or bad. Um, what this allowed us to do, our transition to React Native, allowed our web developers who work on our web team to be able to contribute features to our mobile apps they would not have been able to do before. So if, you on their pro if you're on our, our, our product, you'll notice that we launched recently a Contribution tracker. So it tells you how much room you have left in your TFSA, your RSP, how you can contribute, how much you have room to contribute this year. That was written entirely by our web team, not our mobile team. And if it wasn't for the JavaScript engine, we would not have been able to ship that feature this past quarter. More with less. Always great. When I started here, our mobile team was six people, three iOS, three Android. Those people have moved on to different projects in the company. Our mobile team for the past year has been three full-time developers shipping more features on both platforms for the past year. It's really powerful. Don't use this one. <laughs> Okay, so that's question one, why? Once you've answered why, the second part is, you know, what are the risks? There's always a risk-reward trade-off, right? What can go wrong? Stuff always goes wrong, always. Whoa, come on. There we go, Apple Max, right? I love this chart because it shows 
the line on the left is where we are today. If we've answered Y correctly, we're saying we can get to the line on the top right. You know, there's risk associated whether or not you can actually get up there, but if you've answered Y, then you, you should be able to get up there. The risk comes in here. How long is it going to take? And how much of a drawback are we going to have? So if you've ever learned a new skill, put your hands up here if you've ever tried to learn Vim. How much does this chart apply? I never got past the bottom part. Exactly. <laughs> so when we answer the question, what are the risks, we have to be able to provide risk mitigation strategies. That's a buzzword again, business school, right? All that means is what are you going to do about it? What, what risk, what are you going to do to prevent the risk from happening, to lessen the risk, right? As part of React Native, one of the things that we were scared about was our native team moving to a JavaScript land. JavaScript is scary, it's wild, it's like the wild west of stuff, right? We come from a nice statically compiled language, it's great, the compiler tells us when we're doing stupid things, and then there's JavaScript. So one of the things we did is we were the first team at the company to adopt Flow, which Flow is a static typing engine for JavaScript, and it's helped make the transition a lot simpler for our native developers. I highly recommend static typing but I'm also a static type guy. This is a funny story. Who knows what this is? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. well, let me tell you a funny risk versus reward story. Um, as I said, I have two kids, and Fridays we sometimes do pizza parties. So a couple weeks ago, I called my, my wife and I said, I'm going to pick up the pizza on the way home. I'm going to save the delivery fee. I'm driving right past it, it's going to be great. So I called, I drove, I parked on Queen Street. I'm only going to be in the store five minutes, right? It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Just five minutes. I come back there, you know, to that. The risk I took was I'm not going to get a parking ticket. The reward? So I could save 25 cents. Stupid decision. Don't make that kind of risk reward trade off. There's better ones out there. There's not. So, how do we answer the risk versus rewards question? Oh my gosh, what happened? I did not do that. Anyways, okay. Um, you gotta learn. You gotta read. You gotta watch. You gotta experiment. You gotta start building prototypes with the technology that you pick. Learn about it. So you can talk to it and you can decide what the risks are. And we'll talk about a couple of strategies in a second, which you already saw a little bit on. Okay, so things we've learned here. If you want to make change in your organization, somebody's got to own it. It can be anybody. It doesn't have to be management. It doesn't have to be a senior developer. It can be a junior developer. It doesn't matter. Somebody has to own it. You have to care. You have to believe. You have to answer the why. You have to answer the risks. And if you do that, and you own it, and you do the rest of the stuff, you may or may not be successful. Hopefully successful. You have to become an expert, right? Especially if it's a new technology. Nobody here is going to be an expert. It's your opportunity, even as a junior developer, to become an expert in that thing. But you need to be the person that people go to to answer questions, ask questions of, right? Why are we doing that thing? How do I do this thing? What is this thing? What does that mean? How do I answer this? How do I work on this? You need to do your work. One of the things we did here as part of our transition is you've got to start small, but it has to be sufficiently complex, and that's key. So you want to find a small isolated feature that you can create like a foothold into your legacy system, right? But it has to be sufficiently complex. It has to test a real world scenario. Anybody can prototype a to-do list, right? Does it work for real life? So one of the first things we did in our, our React Native transition is we worked on one of our core onboarding experiences. One of our developers actually did the work at home in his off hours on the weekends and the evenings to prototype this out. It answered the questions, how does the network work? How do the animations work? How does the navigation work? How does this fit into our existing code base? Can we even wedge it in there? 
You don't get all those answers from a to-do list. This is a lie. There's no get out of jail free, right? We worked incrementally. So we didn't stop and we didn't rewrite our app over the course of three months and say, great, three months are gone. We just spent three months of resources. Here's the app. It does exactly the same thing as it did before. No. You pick off pieces as you go, right? Stuff that's working, we leave. And if we want to put bug fixes in, we'll fix bugs. We still have the skills to do that. But as we build new features, or as we revisit existing features, this is the time to evaluate, does it make sense to make this transition of this particular functionality over? And that's actually one of the reasons we picked React Native. It had that ability for us to like piecemeal things together. At some point, you end up with like a little bit of a Frankenstein, and then you get to a point where you're like, I'm just going to finish it off. There's still part of our app today that's still native. I challenge you to tell me which part. So once you've done all this, you need to find allies, you need to find friends, you need to find people in your company that believe in the same mission you do, whether that's water cooler, lunch table, coffee table, walk, park, doesn't matter, but you can't do it alone, right? You need to convince other people. You need to sell it to everybody else. You need to commit to teaching. You can't throw this over the wall. It's not expecting change, it's leading change. You have to become leaders, right? Whether that's creating style guides, pattern guides, documentation, examples, out of your way to pair program with people. If you want this to happen, you have to put in the effort. That's what I'm getting at. It's not easy. It's going to be hard. But how important is it to you? How much does this matter? How much do you think of a change this is going to make? If it matters to you, if it's important to you, if you want to be a high performer, this is what you got to do, and you got to put the effort work in. The effort and work, that was not a mistake. It might have sounded different. And what's the worst that can happen, right? You put all those time, you learn some cool new te technology, you pitch it, and somebody says, no, now's not the time. Cool, I just learned a whole bunch of new shit for my next project. Right? What's the worst? We as software engineers have a unique ability. Our job is so unique to the rest of the world because we have this ability to learn new things. New technologies come out. Our industry changes so much. We can take those new things and we can apply them to the business problems and challenges we face today and really turn the tide of the way businesses work, processes work, our companies work. And that job is unique to engineering and software particularly. I feel like it's our responsibility to challenge ourselves, to push us forward, to do this stuff. It's hard, but it's possible, and we can all do it. Thank you. Cool. Questions? Anybody? Awesome. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what's the last thing you said no to? What is the last thing I said no to? I said no many times today. <laughs> uh, a proposed change that you were forced to apply. One of the things that you have to be careful about is you have to understand um, the business goals and the position your company's in, and you have to understand, you know, how is what you're doing each day going to drive you towards those goals? And if they don't match, you have to say no, right? Like we're we're a company that you know focuses on shipping things quickly, right? So if I can't keep it simple and we can't ship regularly, then I'm going to say no. So there's features that may come up, suggestions that may come up that we may push back on and say, no, this doesn't make sense right now. We need to get things out the door. So you need to consider all of that when you're making these decisions. Yeah. Based on this last slide here, uh, what do you think will be the next change? Like I said, we're working on our front-end JavaScript. We're evaluating whether or not it makes sense today to make changes to, to adopt something other than Angular. Um, we, we haven't done that yet. We've prototyped a few things. We've done the prototyping stage. We've mocked up some, some examples. We've documented some stuff. Um, we have one developer on the team who's, who's really passionate about this and, and really strong on it. Um, 
and he's leading it, and he's our, our guy, and he may or may not be in the room right now. Yes. Given your business cases, what would you say is your tipping point, I guess? What, at what point does the cost-benefit analysis, and obviously it's not a dollar, what kind of ballpark do you put on that, or do you in terms of numbers? Do I, if, if I'm going to make $500 off this, but it's going to cost me, at least what, what's your... Yeah, so the question is, at what point is the risk-reward tilt in your favor? It depends, and that's the problem with business. <laughs> Everything depends, right? Uh, you have to do some analysis. You have to understand the risks um, and the reward, right? So how much am I going to get out of this, and what do I potentially lose, right? Loss could be time, development time. It could be staff. Maybe they don't want to work on your technology anymore, and they want to get out. It could be um, money. It could be you work on something and it never ships, and that's, that's terrible, right? It depends. Um, I had a, someone come up to me today and we talked through whether or not we should automate a certain process of their operations. And you know, the first question was, well, how much time do you spend on it today? And he said, we spend you know, maybe about 15 minutes a week. So we started doing the math. Well, how long do you think it would take to automate this? Two days, right? Well, what's the payback on that? 15 minutes a week times two days? It was like a year. Well, I'm not gonna, we're not going to wait a year for payback on something like this. We can manually do it for now, right? Does that help? Absolutely. For, for a long this can work for someone who's not a high-level person. Sort of an organization needs to be built to take suggestions from levels other than that organization I've recently left for the reasons that it didn't work. Was like it was called a strategic product product manager. So they were like, I have this much money. This is the feature I want. Well, what if we did? Well, what if we did? No, 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 no. This is the feature I want. I have the money. Shut up. So like, is it, like as far as driving organization, I guess this is driving change within an organization. But is there anything you can talk about maybe driving organizational change? The question is, what do you do? when your direct manager may not agree with you or doesn't give you the opportunity to voice your opinion, correct? Close enough? Um, that's hard, right? Um, sometimes the right answer is to leave, right? Um, you know, we may not all have the option of a new job somewhere else waiting for us. Um, It's tough. You have to, I mean, you got to try your hardest to sell it to that person, and if they still don't believe you, you know, if you really, truly believe in it, you might have to go around them. You might have to go up or sideways or, or find someone else to talk to. You need to find that ally that can help pitch for you, be on your team, right, and help drive that forward. Sometimes people are set in their ways, and they can't, they can't change. You know, the worst thing I hate hearing from people is like, that's how we've always done it. I hate that one. Come on. Don't have a great answer for you. Right, so the question is, what do you do if you underestimate the risk and things take longer than they should? How many people in this room have done that? Yeah, we all have. You're not alone. Um, the best thing I can tell people is when you, when you know something's going to be behind, you have to tell people. You have to let them know sooner than later, and then you have to offer solutions. What can I do to fix this? What can I do to be better? And maybe you have to work a little bit harder to fix that, right? Um, if you feel accountable for the error or not. But the, the best thing to do is surface the communication early and say, hey, this is going to be longer than we expected. It's better for you to know now than for you to know the day you expect me to deliver this thing. So when you did the uh, change from native to the um, like what did you do to mitigate So when we moved to React Native, what did we do to mitigate risks? Well, there's a few different risks. One was our do we have the skills on our team to be able to write JavaScript apps, right? 
Uh, another risk was, what if Facebook pulls the plug? Right? What are we going to do? Um, we spend a lot of time training and working on JavaScript uh, on the team. We found people that were in different parts of the organization who were excited about React Native and wanted to work on JavaScript, and we moved them over to that team. We tried to make the environment as friendly as possible, what they were used to already. So like I said, static typing and stuff that they're, they're familiar with. Um, and again, we had somebody leading the change on their own time who was willing to sit with people and help them and coach them through the transition. Um, but again, it's about setting the right expectations on how long something's going to take um, before we see benefit. Yeah, so like I was saying before, we need to find you know simple but sufficiently complex product, like a start place as a start. And then once we have that, we can then look at what's the next thing we're working on, what's the next feature we're revisiting. Does this make sense to also port? Is there enough of a change here or enough of a new thing here that we can port this part over to or not? Um, so we actually built it out in a little bit of chunks over the past year or so. One of your slides was talking about the increase in development speed that you get from changing technologies or paying off technical debt or whatever you like to call it. For me, I do inviting for growth stage startups, and I'm typically engaged by investors to go spend time with their portfolio. One of the things that I run into is that on the technical team, they understand in a very real way the benefits of being faster for development. Then when you get to the executive team, they kind of say, well, how do you know it's going to be faster? How much faster? You know, all, all those sorts of questions. But then when you get to the board, it changes again, and they say, well, we want you to be faster on delivery. So, so how do you manage that interface between the kind of senior level technical staff and the executive staff that are maybe making decisions on budgets or project priorities? Because I, I run into that with the clients that I advise. <laughs> Right. So the question is, how do we, you know, communicate benefits that we is obvious to maybe the technical staff, but not so obvious to upper management or directors? How do we bridge that gap? Or, or maybe even impossible to quantify. So it's going to be faster. Okay, how much? So we're going to be able to ship features more easily. Okay, what's going to be the reduction in the time it takes from the features to the so it, These things are very difficult to quantify. Yeah, they are. But we have to try. Right? We have to. We can't just go into the meeting and say, yeah, it'll be faster, right? Someone on Hacker News told me it'd be faster, right? <laughs> um, we have to try, right? So even if it's wrong, if you go in with something, that's better than nothing, right? Um, but you also have to change your communication styles, right? The way you talk to a developer or a senior engineer is much different than the way I would talk to, you know, our leadership team or our board. And the things I, I emphasize are not. It's much different communication. You've got to look at what people care about and talk to that. Um, one of the other things we've done is we've we've used examples of other companies who have made the transition, right? So we're not we weren't the first company to go to React Native, right? There's many other companies out there already that have reputation in the community. So we can point to these examples and say this company did it, and here's a blog post detailing why. Here's another one where they you know detailing why, right? And it helps when you have that background support. So you don't necessarily have to look internally if there's external examples as well that help. Um, but you have to come with something. So you're talking about change <coughs> and that there are need to be results or rewards different than when you are the risk. Uh, do you see this process completely different from innovation? So how would you handle like initiatives where you don't know what's going to be the outcome or you want to reinvent the product in a completely different way where you don't know the rewards but there is a high risk? Is it a complete different process than driving the change that you described? Right. So the question is, um, is innovation or like R and D or like experimentation uh, does that have a different process and something maybe more defined? Yeah. I don't think so. You know, I think you know if you don't have the information at hand or examples in order to to bring forward, then you have to spend you know a little bit of effort yourself. To, to experiment yourself or quantify yourself um, in order to have that substance. Right? You need to have something to come forward with. Um, 
Otherwise, you're going to get those like crazy faces looking at you. Yeah. But yeah, um, you know, there might be more uncertainty and it might be more questionable, but you know, you can always preface it that way. Like this is this is the first time somebody's ever done this thing, and this is really cool, and I think it's going to do this. But here's why I think it's going to do this, and here's the steps to get there. Does that make sense? Cool. Oh, one way in the back. I didn't see you. So the question is, if, if you come to me and you have a pitch, and I, I don't know if I believe you or not, um, how do you convince me to give you time or money to figure that out? Right. You have to ask me why. Right? That, that one question again, why? Why do I not believe you yet? Ask me that. Right? And then go back, revisit, rework your story, do a little bit more research on your own, and come back and answer that question. Right? Because if I don't believe you, there's a reason why. I'm like, you got to prove it to me. Right? So come to me with something. Once you prove it, then I can come back to you. So how do you find time to do these POCs and proof um, when you're trying to ship other things, right? That depends on your company culture and the type of person you want to be as a developer, right? If you want to be seen as a rising star and somebody who, who brings forth super innovative ideas, and that's what you believe in and you think this technology is the thing to do it, then why are you asking me for time? Just to go figure it out and do your job at the same time, right? Prove to me you're a rising star. Right? That's what I would say to that. Like, I, if, if we can go to our job and we can do our job, right? Nine to five, whatever your hours are, and you can be happy and you can be a successful career and you can do your job and it would be fine. But if you want to lead change, if you want to be on the driving force, if you want to be one of these rising stars who really pushes the envelope of where your company is going, you're going to have to put in a little bit of extra work. There's no, no way around it. Some people have two boys at home, um, and that you know need to feed them. Um, how, how does a company like Lost Control find those people, and give them that opportunity without actually taking them away from their son? Question is, how does a company find people who are excited to work on things, but also spend time with their family? Give them the opportunity to become the, the rising star. Right. You know, there's a Yeah. Um, it's a good question. Um, I struggle, to be honest. I struggle finding time for my family and for my job, but I do put my family first. Uh, although I didn't pick them up tonight, so I will not see them tonight. Um, but you know, I, I think that's like a personal reflection. You know, as, as you, as an individual. What kind of trade-offs do you want to make? And, and no one's going to look at you incorrectly for, for certain decisions. And the company you work for, if you set those expectations correctly with your management and, and your boss, and like, look, you know, I need to leave at 4:30 every day because I need to go to like baseball and karate and swim class. Then, you know, hopefully your work culture um, respects that. And that's what I would say. Right? Like, I don't have a great answer for that. Just to sort of pull off that, I think it's also like. Have, if you have that culture that takes POCs that are done on the side cold, the people will find the time for that. Whereas if you take somebody who's gone and built something and if you shelf it and say, not now, not ever, then I, I mean, that's. Yeah, I think um, if you're in a management position and you have teams working for you, that's a very important thing to consider on how you deliver a yes or no answer to that person. Because you don't want to discourage that behavior. Um, but sometimes you need to be 
you know, this doesn't match, or go back and revisit it, or try again, right? Like, this might not be the right time. And, you know, often it's not the right time. But if, you're, if you do manage people here, then it's very important that you deliver that well. Thank you.